Welcome to another amazing episode of Thyroid Refresh video podcast. I'm Dana Bowman, co-founder of Thyroid Refresh. And I'm Jenny Mahar, co-host and co-founder as well of Thyroid Refresh. And we're so happy to be here today with Terry Cochran, an amazing nutritionist, you guys. She is such an incredible resource that we're so excited to share with you today if you don't already know about her. Um, Terry really brings a lot of uh, cutting edge information, I feel like, to the world of nutrition. And I was first exposed to her when um, Dana and I first met and started working together. She was on Thyroid Nation Radio and introduced um, the uh, a, a lot a number of different concepts that that we'll get into. But uh, welcome, Terry. We're so glad to be here with you today. It's so great to be with you guys and see you all again. It's been almost a year. Happy to be back. It's, it's really, really, it's incredible. There's a lot that's happened in a year, uh, definitely for Thyroid Nation Radio and for this new venture, Thyroid Refresh. But before we get into some of the juicy stuff, will you tell the listeners and viewers, since we're doing video, uh, a little bit about yourself, your history, how you got where you are, and maybe a little bit about your recent history, if, if you feel that might be relevant too. Of course. Well, I had a 20-year corporate career. When my son was born, by the age of three, we were told he wouldn't be normal, uh, that he would start having brain seizures. He had the bone density of an 18-month-old. He wasn't walking. He wasn't talking. He was really failing to thrive. And we live in the metro DC area, and I availed myself of what I thought were the best doctors in the area, and they were clearly the best doctors in the area. He was only getting sicker and weaker. And I decided being a Cuban refugee and a solution seeker rather than being the victim mentality that the fate that had been cast upon my son was not going to be his fate. And so I had a day job and I had, I had a significant corporate career, but my night job was finding a solution for my son's health. And I had been a risk manager for a large Fortune 500 company. I became a risk manager for my son's health. And before the age of the internet, before the age of Google, I just dove deep into the library, parents, other practitioners. Why was my son doing what he was doing? Why was his body expressing itself the way it was? And I had an epiphany uh, over a mountain of books one night on my kitchen table saying, oh my gosh, it's what we're feeding him. And the food is literally a poison to him. And within five days of eliminating what are now known to be top allergens, gluten and peanuts and, uh, and soy and citrus and dairy, he started breathing. And then I continued my, my research. And even though I had a very, very successful career, I decided to let that all go and be that mother for other mothers that were told you have no solution. Wow. And, I love that way of putting that, mm -hmm. be that mother for other mothers. Mm hmm And so it was really just a journey of discernment. And I went back to school, uh, studied a just a host of modalities from functional nutrition to herbology to cranial sacral to healing touch. Um, and then I started my, my own practice and fast forward almost 15 years later, uh, you know, we're very blessed to have a very, uh, inter an international practice, thyroid being one of our uh, disciplines of ex expertise. And so it's just been a real, a real joy and a humbling uh, experience. And we live in deep gratitude, myself and my staff, with all the people that we're able to touch in a positive way and really tell them that nothing is impossible and then really see that nothing is impossible. Wow. Hmm. Um, one of the things that um, Dana and I have been talking about ever since you did the interview with Thyroid Nation Radio is sulfur sensitivity. And so I've been kind of dying to ask you about that. Now, this is something that when I first heard about it, you know, I said to Dana, I, I almost don't even want to know because, you know, sulfur <laughs> is found in so many foods, like, and as a cook and a chef, almost every recipe I make, it seems like it starts with garlic and onions, right? Well, those are high sulfur foods as is avocado, tomato, um, some cruciferous vegetables, right? Right. So, um, but we yeah, keep so hearing did. about this she sensitivity. She did tell me that. She did. She said, yeah. okay, that's it. That's it. I can't. <laughs> They've already given up enough foods. Yes. <laughs> but, um, you know, great big question marks came up for us. And Dana's co-host, Tiffany Mladenich, 
she started experimenting with eliminating sulfur and was able to make some really incredible strides with her health that she hadn't been able to make for a long time. So this was something that we really um, were excited to share with our viewers and listeners today. And I was hoping maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yes, well, I'm happy to share about the sulfur phenomena. I really believe we're becoming an, uh, a society of impaired sulfur processing mechanisms. And what's really interesting, it's, it's because of the, the way that we grow our food supply in the United States. And Dr. Stephanie Seneff out of MIT has done some groundbreaking research on how sulfur is, the mechanism of sulfur in our body is being impaired. And we need sulfur. Sulfur is important in its end state called sulfate for our ligaments, our tendons, our hormones, our neurotransmitters, the integrity of our gut. It, sulfur is an all-encompassing in its end state sulfate healing element. However, what, what she has found and what I have corroborated through independent research is that the glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, which is sprayed all over our crops, especially gluten. There's a half a billion tons of Roundup sprayed annually on our crops. That is, that's just crazy. The numbers are crazy. And it goes into the groundwater too. But Roundup is having, and glyphosate in essence, is having these deleterious effects on our body. And it's twofold. One is it makes the body think it's producing an amino acid. I'm getting a little nerdy by the name of glycine. So amino acids are important. This one in particular is to help us break down protein. So that's why we are the mutant gluten in the United States is creating an epidemic of celiac and or gluten intolerance. I think one in 10 of us now have a gluten intolerance. The second thing though, is it stops sulfur and it tracks and we can no longer process sulfur, especially if we are one of those individuals, myself included, that have genetics that say, guys, you guys aren't naturally great sulfur metabolizers. And there's three major gene polymorphisms that get us there. I got, I got two out of the three. Yes. So when you can't break down sulfur, our guts leak, our minds leak, our brains leak, and our emotions leak. And so it is really, really deleterious. And so that healthy kale salad is going to really kick your butt if you have that sensitivity because it's going to effectively break through your intestinal barrier and elicit an immune response at worst, but at least a histamine response. And they now say leaky gut, leaky brain. And sulfur being cruciferous, a part of the cruciferous family and vegetables are really high in sulfur content. We know that for the most part, uh, sulfuric and cruciferous vegetables impair thyroid function. A lot of them are considered goitrogens. So you add, you know, that one, two punch of, oh my goodness, I'm eating, um, something in my diet, gluten, that's affecting my ability to process protein and process sulfur. That's going to affect my thyroid. And it's going to affect a lot more other things. Arthritis, 73% of individuals with RA, rheumatoid arthritis, linked to sulfur sensitivity. Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, ADHD, asthma, Parkinson's. It's very, it's, it's broad reaching. Wow. And it's, it's such empowering information. I mean, we don't want to overwhelm people, of course, but just to know that, you know, it isn't always as simple as just eliminate gluten, eliminate dairy, eliminate sugar, etc. You know, we're talking about bio individual nutrition. So I have a couple questions that come to mind. One is how do you test for sulfur sensitivity? And two, is there hope if you find that you're sensitive to it, that you can heal enough to be able to eat sulfur containing foods again. Oh, please. That's, that's oh, please. A please. <laughs> there's a good, there's a good answer and a happy answer at the end of it. My, one of my hashtags is heal and seal your gut and you can eat rocks. Okay. So <laughs> it's really about reestablishing that gut biome and the gut integrity. So to your question of how do we know? Well, the way you really know is through, using a genetic analysis, 23andMe, or other gene tests out there that will sh tell you, do I have the CBS gene or the SUOX gene or the, or the BH4 gene? Those are the three big gene polymorphisms we look at that will tell you you have that. But another way, we call it body talk. The body talks to us. If you eat asparagus and you can smell it on the way out in your toilet, we call it the canary in the coal mine. You know, it's like asparagus is a tattletale saying, guys, you, you're, not, you're not doing such a good job of breaking down your sulfur. 
Another way is, you know, if you really have significant asthma, if you have ADHD, if you go to a salad bar and you have an allergy afterwards or feel itchy, if you have trouble with wine, sulfites in wine, um, those things, if you have arthritis, if you have a family history of arthritis, if it runs down your family lineage, that's probably an indicator that you have a sulfur sensitivity. Um, but again, I have, I have two of the three polymorphisms, and I have what I call a respectful relationship with my sulfur friends. <laughs> I'm not going to eat them every day. I'm certainly not going to juice with them first thing in the morning. I would not do a kale or arugula smoothie or juice in the morning because I'm coming out of a you know, fast, if you will, an evening fast. But I do have my kale salad every here and there. I do have my arugula salad every here and there. I do cook with garlic now. But that's because I've also done other things in my diet and repertoire that allow me to have a really uh, good and, and integrated gut biome. So I can do that now. Wow, that's mm. that's great to hear. Um, <laughs> that gives me hope because I feel like, you know, having had some um, sulfur sensitivity, I feel like that's, you know, at least on my personal, you know, healing journey, some, maybe some experimentation with eliminating sulfur is in my future. Now, just a um, quick question. Is that, what about an allergy to sulfa antibiotics? That's a that great point. Yes, absolutely. Sulfa, sulfites, uh, sulfates. Yes, that is one of the big guns. And in, um, we will have a qu an online quiz. We're launching our, our program this year, the Heal and Seal program. And along with our companion, the Wildatarian book. Um, and we have a quiz and the quiz will say, hey guys, can you process sulfur? And when you take the quiz, you'll be able to say, yes, I can, no, I can't, among other things. Wow. So now that everyone's going, oh no, maybe I can't eat sulfur. <laughs> can you maybe, can we sort of like maybe reel it back in and give our listeners who are all, you know, thyroid patients in some form, is there a is is there a simple starting point for thyroid patients who maybe are currently eating the standard American diet, with all your expertise and everything you know? Can you give us some simple starting points for people just beginning this journey? Yes, um, one of the simple starting points is really about having a real awareness on how to read food labels. So the first thing is, if you can't read it, don't eat it. So that's just a really simple simple way to do it. If you're having to think about, oh my gosh, all these consonants have strung together or numbers and colors, try not to do that. But the, the other a good thing about it is we think about the word diet as a, a word, a low vibration word that means it is deprivation based. When am I going to stop having to be on a diet and how fast can I stop eating these foods that are so limited, if you will. And so if we can change diet, and again, this is about how our thoughts create our, our immune system, because we know that thoughts have a destructive or a productive effect on the body, and that's out of research, I think out of UPenn, where you can improve your immune system for up to 50% for five hours if you're thinking happy, joyful, uh, gratitude thoughts, and you can decrease your immune system for up to 50% for five hours if you're having destructive, negative, self-harm thoughts. And that's science. That's that science. Is science. So, that is clear that's science. And so if we think of, I've in, I have redefined diet to be everything we consume in life. Our surroundings, because we had a, a very rainy, I live in the D.C. area, we had a very rainy, dark day yesterday, and I shared with one of my clients, wow, I can be really upset that it's rainy and dark, or I can say, wow, what a not great opportunity to sit by the fire with a warm cup of uh, uh, tea and a little lemon and really just self-care and nourish and maybe write in my serenity journal and really be grateful for this really calming day. So it's how we look at things, the thoughts we consume, the environment we consume, and knowing that diet is everything we consume in life and looking at it from a place of abundance and gratitude. And what am I going to eat instead that's really going to nourish my body? Because the body talks to us. And when we are miserable because we're eating that kale salad and our joints hurt and we are foggy headed and we are bloated, and if we know that if we eat instead a, a salad with a romaine lettuce or bib lettuce with a little bit of cilantro and cucumber and some carrot shavings and you put a, a nice piece of salmon on there, 
and your body's going to be so happy. That's not a deprivation state. That's a state of gratitude saying, oh my gosh, my body is going to be so happy and therefore I will be better and feel better as a result. I love that. And I'm hungry now. <laughs> but it's so true. It's focus on, you know, the things that we can have, not the things we can't. And mindset is so huge. So it's really, um, I guess, validating or, you know, encouraging, inspiring to hear that, how powerful that is for us, you know, especially coming from you. Um, and you, you and mentioned, I think you mentioned already in there, your wildatarian uh, do you call it a wildatarian diet? Or do you talk, call it a wildatarian program? What do you call it? But I'd actually, like to talk about it a little bit, if you don't mind. I'd love to talk about it, actually. And I at, renamed it to, to be called the wildatarian diet, and I did it purposely. The book comes out March 12th on Amazon. It's already on pre-order, so you can, if you want to buy it on pre-order, it's, it's available. But I, I purposely changed it to diet because I want us to think about diet differently. And, you know, I, I really lead with that. It is it is wild, the wildatarian diet, living as nature intended. And nature intended us for us to have a bounty of foods, to live in a joyous, simple life of gratitude. And so back to our thoughts and our behaviors and our patterns, because we tend to be, if we're in the less than, that's where we will live. We are only as good as our limiting beliefs. We're only as healthy as our limiting beliefs. If we believe and we've been told that you will be sick and we believe that, that's where we will be. And one of my mantras and one of my hashtags for my practice is nothing is impossible. We have to know that nothing is impossible. Just like my son, my son who was told he will be that, that's all you can do, live with it. Not necessarily. If we ask the right answers, excuse me, if we ask the right questions, the right answers will follow. And that is really led my entire practice where we are, we are solution seekers. If we don't know it yet, we don't know it today, we're going to keep looking for that answer. And that has led us to what I believe are some really groundbreaking discoveries and it, our, our client base has benefited from it. It's very powerful. So I'm curious, you know, uh, my husband's a hunter. Is is wild a terrian? Are we talking about wild game, literally? Or um, can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, what the what wild a terrian entails? Absolutely. So wild a terrian can be wild game for sure. You know, if you have a hunter in your family or friends that are hunters, venison, wild boar, one of my, one of my nutritional counselors, who's a young, beautiful woman, is a hunt, huntress, and she does bow and arrow, and she's brought me back wild boar and venison, and we have really enjoyed that. Um, but there are many avenues uh, throughout the country that will supply non amyloid rich and i'm going to talk about this so basically what's happening is the crowding and the growing of our domesticated animals beef and chicken in particular but pork and turkey as well the crowding conditions and the way we grow them have a created one of these aberrant indigestible proteins in the tissues of the animals which then we are consuming and it's making us sick and the the, the latest research on beta amyloids and alzheimer's but Adenomas are amyloids that are found in the pituitary, and pituitary is so critical to thyroid health because the pituitary, I call it air traffic control, which tells all of our organ systems what to do, including the thyroid. And so these amyloids are now implicated in contributing to 50 major conditions in our country. That's nuts. So again, part of the reason is the, 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 clearly the amyloids, and then you you, you have the amyloids, and then you pair that with our mutant gluten, which has the glyphosate, which doesn't allow us to break down protein. You've got indigestible protein, and we can't break down protein. We've got a protein problem. And so the wildatarian approach seeks to minimize those amyloid-containing foods. And so we love bison, and we love elk, and antelope, and venison, and wild boar. And although lamb and Cornish game hen are not technically wild, we have found through our clinical outcomes that if you're eating some of those meats along with the others that I've just mentioned, your amyloid um, content will be, will be lowered. And we have seen this to be proven over and over again. In particular, my patient zero, as I call him, or client zero, where he had end-stage amyloidosis, where amyloids had wrapped around his heart. It was a very rare form of cancer. And again, I didn't know, understand what amyloids were, but there I went and I started seeking what the heck are amyloids and why are they here? 
And four years later, he's driving his bike to work as a tax attorney in DC and he's defied cancer. So that was a really big deal. And that was really my foray into what are these amyloids and what are they doing to our body? And I'm lucky enough to have an ex NIH scientist on my staff. She's been with me for four years and she's the one I sit out and say, her name is Sarah, Sarah, go find, go find this in the clinical literature. I know it's out there. And we generally, we, we find it. That's why we love you, Terry. And uh-huh. we love what you do so much because, you know, here as a thyroid patient, walking the walk, you know, living the life, you hear high quality animal protein, eat high quality animal protein. You help us understand why, why, why and why it's so important, why it matters, not just for the environment, but really for our health on these really complex levels that are so huge and important. So, um, so what, just, do you, what would you say about grass-fed beef and, and pasture raised and, I mean, in, you know, small moderation? Great question. And we say that the wild Italian lifestyle is on a continuum. So if you're certainly pasture fed is going to be so much better, so much better than uh, a traditionally feedlot raised animal. But we know that DNA is transgenerational, and we don't know if that cow's mother or grandmother was a feedlot cow. And so that's the thing. Now, if you have heritage breeds, we have found that heritage breeds are really very, very healthy uh, because they they were never DNA tinkered with, if you will. Um, But yes, certainly here and there. um, And again, as we heal and seal our gut and, and take away those things which cause a tipping point because the body is a brilliant machine doing multiple chemical processes round the clock but when the emotional and the toxic burdens of our lifestyle and our diet hit a tipping point the body responds and saying guys i've had enough (laughs) right Well, thank you so much for being here with us today, Terry. It's just been so fascinating and um, we're, we're very grateful for you to share your time with us. Um, before we sign off, is there anything else you might want to share with our listeners just as far as um, maybe changing our relationship with food or, or different lifestyle factors uh, for us to keep in mind? Uh- Absolutely. Uh, No one of us is immune to disease. And from a personal perspective, I had a life transition um, that was very difficult and stress made me very, very ill this summer. Extremely ill. Were they saying it was life-threateningly ill for me? And what I what I found out again through my research, why did stress do this to me? They say that um, the clinical research shows that stress is one of the biggest reactivators of viral loads in our body. And Dr. Mark Hyman just recently came out with very, very shocking information that corroborates our our thoughts and our findings, saying that disease, 95% of disease is either created or exacerbated by stress. And so what I want to leave your listeners with is the thought creates the thing. And if we think about things that are negative in our life, if we think about everything that's wrong in our life, if we live in that fear-based mentality, we will create a fear-based reality. And so if they could just shift their thinking and, and notice what you're noticing in your body, what am I feeling right now? Is, is, th- is that thought making me feel good or bad? And if it's making us feel bad, shake it off. Change, the, change your physical environment, move to another place in your house, go outside, take a breath, and shift the thinking, because the thinking will shift our immune system. And so you don't need to be educated in nutrigenomics or epigenetics or biochemistry, or you don't have to read a bunch of books, and I'm not saying all that is wonderful, because I think education is empowering, but our thoughts are everything. And it is easy to shift the thought from that which is low vibration and fear-based and negative to that which is high vibration and in gratitude, joy, and abundance. Well wow. said. Well said. What That's, a perfect note to end on. <laughs> That's right. So powerful. Thank you. 
Thank you, Terry. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you all for uh, viewing and listening here today on another episode of Thyroid Refresh uh, radio podcast or video podcast, excuse me. Um, and um, if you'd like to find Terry, um, Terry, where can the listeners go to learn more about what that you do? Absolutely. It's uh, terrycochran.com, T-E-R-I, Cochran, C-O-C-H-R-A-N-E.com. And we've just launched a new website this week. It speaks to the Wildatarian Diet and our Heal and Seal program and all the cool stuff we have going on. I'm really excited to share that with the world. So thank you again for allowing me to have a platform in which to share. Thank and you. thank you for your amazing work, Terry. <laughs> Definitely. All okay, right. Guys, thank you. See you okay. next time.